It was funny, during the first service, I was about a third thrill in, then I realized that it's Reformation Day. I was like, it's Reformation Day. I was like, yes, that's amazing, because I was like, that fits so well with what I'm preaching. <laughs> confirmation for me, and especially with the worship team, the lyrics, everything, uh, Tana's announcement. We don't talk to each other. No, we don't communicate at all. <laughs> so, no, no, I'm joking. But we didn't talk, like Melinda didn't tell me, oh, I'm going to be singing these songs, or Tannis didn't say, I'm going to be reading this scripture. And, and so it just everything clicked, and then it was Reformation Day. It was like, yes, thank you, God. And um, I want to start with a prayer. Thank you, Father. Thank you for this day that you have made. Thank you for this building. Thank you for the worship team, the people here, the tech team, kids ministries, ushers and greeters, and all these people that make this happen. Thank you for calling out gifts, giftings in people. I pray that you would keep calling them out. I pray that you would keep encouraging us as believers to continue the good walk, pursue you, and as we grow, we adjust, we try different things, and we want to grow in you. And I pray that you give us boldness to try things, to speak out things, to be active and alive for you. And I, I thank you that your prayer answers often look different than what we might like or how we think that should look like. We pray for a bigger heart and you send us people to love. We pray for wisdom and you give us problems to solve. We pray for courage and you send us things that require courage. And often we miss these answers because we think that they should look differently. Thank you for your answers, and you're never too late. Amen. Amen. Acts chapter 4. <laughs> whoop, whoop. Uh, I'm just going to start right away. Verse 1. Bam. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus of the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So 5,000 now. It's pretty, pretty epic. That is a lot of growth. And uh, we need to remember that, yes, we see chapter 3 and then chapter 4, and we might think, oh, there's a time gap. But no, there is no time gap. Remember that they went at 3 o'clock to the temple to pray and worship, and that's when the healing happened. And now it's evening, which means that the sun is going down. It's probably around 6 or 7, depends on the time. And so they've been worshiping, praying, uh, administering to people for about three or four hours. I was like, that's pretty awesome. Would I have the stamina for, for that? Like, <laughs> would I be checking my clock? I was like, oh, okay, I've been prayed for 20 minutes. I'm out of my list. Uh, but you know what? When miracles are happening and the supernatural is breaking through, I'm pretty sure we would all stay for three or four hours and want more and more and more. And that's a part of my prayer for today, that we just want more. And however that looks. But why were the Sadducees so upset? Have you ever thought about that? They were so greatly disturbed. <laughs> Was it because of the healing? That they were preaching and causing a scene at the temple? Was it because they were teaching the people or because they were talking about Jesus? No, it was none of that. It was because they spoke about the resurrection from the dead, which the Sadducees deny is real. And um, I think a quick, super quick synopsis of 
Jewish leadership during that time is in order. So don't check out. It's going to be super short. <laughs> but it really frames it why it's necessary to know the, the governing structure that the, both Jesus and the apostles were dealing with at, at that time. We have two groups. We have the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they're not just religious groups. That's often what we think. No, they were political groups. They were, um, they were religious groups and political groups, and they had also judicial power, which means that they had a court. They were really kind of, if we, if we think about, you know, liberals and then conservatives, the Sadducees were more liberal and the Pharisees were more conservative. And then they used to fight in-house, just like we have with our own government. And uh, these were the people in charge. And uh, it's known as the Sanhedrin, the council. And it had 71 members. And that was the main council. It was located in Jerusalem. And then in each village, you would have a small Sanhedrin or council with 23 members. And so we might believe, as I often believed when I was growing up, uh, that the Jews did not have any autonomy, but that's wrong. Um, they were ruled with the Romans, yes, ruled by the Romans. But that's not really the case because they, the Romans, they genuinely wanted Pax Romana, like they wanted peace. They wanted to govern, but they gave people, as long as they didn't rebel, they gave them a lot of leeway. Um, so the Jews, they could observe their ancestral law without any hindrance. They could worship God. They did not have to worship any imperial god. And so they did not have to join the military, for instance. They could collect temple tax, and they could uphold their own laws. And they had their own council, and they could really kind of govern themselves as long as they didn't really interfere with the Romans. <laughs> and they could make their own arrests, which is interesting. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were different in many ways. The Sadducees, like I said, did not believe in an afterlife. There's no resurrection from the dead. There's no punishment. They didn't really believe in angels and demons. Um, they had different beliefs about many things. And uh, they only believed that the first books, five books of Moses were authoritative. Everything else was kind of a commentary on the Torah. So after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the Sadducees were no more. They were, they were gone. Um, but the Pharisees, they survived as a sect within Judaism after 70 AD, which is interesting. But talking about the Reformation, they just reformed Judaism to be rabbinical Juda Judaism instead of biblical Judaism. So it was like, oh, we don't have a temple. Let's just change a few rules. Uh, let's make it work. Um, so that's really a super short synopsis um, on Judaism and the government within that time that the apostles were facing right there. Um, these two sects ruled over the people. That was their government at the time. And they had their own laws and regulations. And they had their own court. So in light of all of this, brand new information, no, for some of you, that when Jesus was arguing with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he was arguing and speaking out against both the religious system, but also the political and the judicial system at the same time. This was the entity. This was the governing body over the people. So we can't really say that Jesus was not political. Jesus was partisan. I'm just going to wait. <laughs> A lot of people are like, oh, and? Exactly. Thank you, Paul. He was partisan to the kingdom of God. That was his party. And they have his party, his, the kingdom of God, has governing rules, regula regulations, and all these things. And Jesus spoke out against corruption. He spoke out against twisting God's word into something that it doesn't say. And he warned the powers that be that God, his father, is not really happy, and happy with how they're administrating things. He spoke out against the political entities and their hypocrisy, and he addressed publicly what was going on that was wrong. He wasn't silent. And Paul did the same. He 
paid for it with his life. Paul was in prison at least three times that we know of. In Acts chapter 21, the Jews caused a riot, a mostly peaceful riot. <laughs> and it made, they arrested Paul, and that's the arrest that leads to his death in Rome. Peter was loyal to Jesus as well, and he paid for it with his life. So did many other apostles. Why do we think Herod Agrippa killed James, the brother of John, in Acts chapter 12? Why do we believe Stephen was stoned in Acts chapter 7? He was brought before the council, the 71 men, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he spoke truth to the political entity at the time, and they killed him for it. So before we quote Romans 13 and say that Christians should never enter into a political discussion or that we should blindly follow everything that the government says, we should ask ourselves if that's what Jesus and the apostles truly did. There's ample proof that in the New Testament that Jesus and his disciples engaged in what was going on around them. They engaged in society. And it's interesting, if we ever go through the book of Revelation, which, we, which I hope we do at one time, it's a harsh rebuke against Rome and Israel. It's a rebuke veiled in symbolism because it's a highly political document. And John had to write it in a certain, a certain way. And we need to understand that. Um, I do think that Peter and John knew that it was better to stand for something than fall for anything. And here in the text, we have 5,000 men that believed. That's not counting the women. So we can guesstimate that the number is probably around 10,000 or so. Because let's be frank, women are way more apt <laughs> at accepting the gospel, praying, and then dragging the men along, you know. <laughs> Thank God for women. So they're probably 10,000 plus at that time. They are arrested because they taught about the resurrection. They were offended and greatly disturbed, this political group. Should they have not proclaimed the truth then? Because they defended a certain group in their society? No, they spoke to the people the truth, their convictions. Let's continue with, uh, from verse 5. And it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all that to all people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Whew. Bold. It's not pulling any punches. Here we have Peter telling the rulers, the rulers of the people, that you killed Jesus. And God raised him up. See, it's interesting. God has one agenda, and he's telling them, you have another agenda. These two don't mix. Peter does this again in Acts chapter 5, a chapter later. <laughs> it's amazing. But Peter, he's, um, he is stunning. And in chapter 5, he's arrested again. <laughs> you don't get arrested if you follow everything that the rulers want. Peter didn't water down his message when he was arrested again. 
He didn't think just a chapter later, um, this is going to offend them, so I'm just going to cut out the name of Jesus, not talk about the resurrection, how can I bumble wrap this, so they're going to accept it. He was like, no, the truth is the truth. Sorry, take it or leave it. He was not going to skip the part about Jesus and the resurrection. He was not. He didn't think, oh, I should skip that part because they might cancel me. No. (laughs) He was not worried about that. No, he's brought before the Sanhedrin, the council, again. And they tell Peter in chapter 5, verse 28, did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. Already playing political games. Because what did they say, the same men, just a few months earlier, before Pilate, when they crucified Christ? His blood be on us and our children. And now the same guys are saying, this man's blood is supposed to be on us. You can already see the games that they're playing. They were there. In John chapter 19, verse 15, Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. Wow. We have no king but Caesar? Did they forget about God the Father? That is their true king? This is a profound statement coming from the chief priests. This is not just anybody. These are the rulers saying, we are loyal to Caesar. We have no other king but Caesar. They're telling Pilate who their allegiance is to. Their king is Caesar, not God. And the irony of all of this is that the so-called people of God want to kill the Son of God... When the Gentile, the the Roman is like, no, no, hold on. (laughs) Can we just talk about this? What has he done? There's something going on there. So here Peter is standing before the same people that killed Christ. And full of the Holy Spirit, he goes all in. All in. And remember, Peter from before. Remember that. But Peter. Now he's not afraid. Not afraid at all. The rooster can crow as many times as it wants. He's not going to deny the name of Jesus ever again. Peter has been transformed by the Holy Spirit into something else. He's been regenerated. He's been given power. He's been empowered to talk the truth. And whatever they throw at him, he's not worried about it. Like, I know, Jesus is on my side. You have an agenda that does not align with God's. I'm not afraid. I know where I'm going to end up. That's why I think we in this church need more of the Holy Spirit. We need more empowerment. We want to see all these things happen. We want to be bold. We want to be the new Peter, not the pre-Peter that was afraid. Because we are no longer slaves to fear. We've been born again. We have the Holy Spirit. If we're slaves to something, we're slaves to Christ because he owns us. When we talk about somebody being Lord and King, we need to know how a king functioned, how a Lord functioned. If the Lord, oh yeah, the title of my sermon, forgot to tell you. (laughs) He's the ruler of kings. I take it from uh, Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. He's the firstborn from the dead. He rules the kings of the earth. That's why we say he's the king of kings. That's that's why we say if God tells you to do something, you follow the king of kings. That's what that means. That's why the beauty of the Reformation, that we applaud, that we say, awesome. You have to remember... That Luther, when he hung those 95 theses, he was speaking to the powers that be, the Roman Catholic Church. And so, probably many of his friends quoted Romans 13 to him. But he knew the truth. He wasn't afraid. 
because he had the Holy Spirit. He's like, no, I'm going to nail these things. Because God convicted him. It was the truth. Many people died. Many, many, many people died during the Reformation because it was worth it. Peter asked if they should be judged for a good deed done to a helpless man. Can you even wonder, why do they even have to ask the question? Why are you like, arresting us for healing somebody that's been lame for 40 years, 40 plus years? Can you imagine the depravity, the hardness of the heart? Like how far from the kingdom of God are these people? Honestly. Because they didn't break any law. Teaching about the resurrection from the dead was not illegal. Remember that the Pharisees believed that. The Sadducees weren't jailing the Pharisees for believing that. But they thought, no, let's just rest them now. It's evening. Throw them in jail and talk about it tomorrow. And let's figure out some trumped up charges because we don't like this. What did... What they did was heal a man in the name of Jesus Christ. And what does it mean to do something in the name of Jesus? We sometimes say this, in the name of Jesus, this. Well, if you're a police officer, you can say, stop in the name of the law. You can do that. That means you've been assigned a certain authority to do so. You act as an agent of something that's more powerful than you. You can speak or do a certain action because in the name that you do it in, it gives you the power to do so. In that name, truly has the authority to do so. So if I say, stop, in the name of the law, the person jogging in front of me is just going to jog. Like, they're not going to stop. I have no authority to tell them to stop jogging, you know. Um, So you might say to a single police officer that he or she does not have the authority to do so. But if you run away, you quickly discover that behind that single officer is a powerful entity It does have the power to stop you, restrain you, catch you. You figure that out pretty quickly if you try to run. It's the same with us. You might look like a single agent, a single ambassador of Christ. But behind you stands something with so much power, divine power, that does have authority more authority and more reach and more power than anything in this world, natural or spiritual. The Trinity is on your side. They are on your agenda. That's the amazing part. I think we as the church need to start realizing which team we're playing for, the winning team. So when we say in Jesus' name, that needs to mean something. Remember uh, my last sermon about Acts 19. Jesus I know and Peter I know of, but who are you? The authority piece. It's so important that we as a church grow in authority. We mature. So when we say in the name of Jesus, everything that's going on around us listens. It's interesting to note that Peter starts by saying that it was in the name of Jesus this was done. And then he concludes his statement by saying that by him, that by him, by Jesus, this man stands before you whole. By Jesus. See, Jesus did this. Peter and John did not do that. Jesus did that. Because Jesus is alive. He's been resurrected. He's at the right hand of the Father right now with all power, all power. He's more powerful now than he was before. You know why? Because he's conquered evil. He is the keys of death and Hades. He is all power. That's the side that we are on. 
he is the one who did this. Can you imagine the Sadducees and the Pharisees, these pious, important men, now shaking in their boots because they're like, we killed this guy. And now they're doing this in the name of Jesus, and he's actually healed. There was a miracle. They couldn't deny it. I would be worried. I would feel, what did I do? Jesus saves. Jesus is alive and more powerful than we can imagine. And there's only one name that saves. I, yes, I know it doesn't matter how offensive that might be today. That is still the truth. There's one name that saves. Jesus saves. And in Christ alone, we, it, it's only in Christ, Christ alone, that we find what we are looking for. Whatever we seek for. Verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred amongst themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter, <laughs> I love it, but Peter, that rascal, um, it's kind of hard to keep that man under control, apparently. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. You judge that. God has given us conviction. God has given us the Holy Spirit. We're going to be judged by God. We're going to worry about that. You judge the rest. Don't care. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people. The people. We the people have some power. Since they all glorify God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. <laughs> we don't know why they realized these men had been with Jesus. We can only guess. Maybe it was because they remembered them. Or maybe it was because of how they spoke. Untrained men speaking as if they were trained. Remember what Jesus told the disciples in Luke chapter 12. Now when they bring you to the synagogues and magistrates and authorities, do not worry about how or what you should answer or what you should say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit will teach you in the very hour what you ought to say. And that's what I believe was happening there and then. How Peter spoke reminded them of how Jesus spoke. There was something there. It's the same spirit. And the council was left speechless, which I love. <laughs> because in an honor and shame culture, if you left the other party speechless, you brought great shame to them. Especially... If the other party had more prestige and was more educated than you. And since they can't say anything to them, they take a bathroom break and they're like, what do we do? What do we do? They're ashamed. They've been dishonored. They don't know what to say. The people are on their side. What should we do with these guys? We cannot deny that a miracle has taken place. It's obvious. So let's just threaten them and let them go. Yes, that worked out really well. Next chapter, rest them again and again. <laughs> Peter and John replied, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more 
then to God you judge. It's amazing. It's an epic answer. For we cannot but speak the things which have, we have seen and heard. If it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. We have already decided. <laughs> we have made up our mind. We know who our Lord and Savior is. They knew him pretty well. They walked with him for three years. The Holy Spirit comes down, gives them conviction that goes against what the government is telling them to do. They have decided who they are following. Because remember, the Lord Jesus is the Lord of kings of the earth. That's the ultimate authority. We are going to do this This is clearly defying a direct request from the political, religious, and judicial powers at the time. The leaders of the people. And I know, especially I think in Canada, it's interesting because I have this contrast of Europe, you know, where we're all like red-blooded, rebellion, yes, you know, revolution and reformation and fight the power. And then sometimes in Canada, I'm like, well, it's kind of missing. <laughs> like, uh, I'm sorry, not sorry. Sorry about, sorry about, I'm here. Um, um, it's, it's, so, it's so funny. Uh, and so somebody here in the crowd, I can see on some faces, you're not liking the message because it's like, but, but Jesus would never defy the powers that be. Well, he did. Sorry, it's in the Bible. You have to talk to him about that. Um, and uh, because we should defy things that go against our conscience, our heart, our minds, everything that the Holy Spirit is telling us to do. If somebody else, doesn't matter who it is, tells you something different, you should say no. You should say no. So this reminded me of a story in Luke chapter 13. When Jesus healed the crippled woman for 18 years, she had been crippled. 18 years. Jesus calls her over and heals her. Just like that. And she glorifies God. But the ruler of the synagogue was not happy. Can you imagine again the hardness of the heart? Not being happy about that. Because they had their rules. He was not happy because of the rules set by the authorities. It was the Sabbath. Jesus shouldn't heal on the Sabbath. It's against the law. Well, sometimes the law is wrong. Sorry. And he actually told Jesus, can you imagine? Like, if I was the Son of God, all-powerful, like, I would just zap him. I would go, <laughs> I can't imagine the grace and the love that Jesus had. Like, he could call in legions of angels, whatever the problem was. He was God. And he was like, he listened to that guy. You know, honestly, I would be like, shut it. Like, nope, nope. Zip it. Like, do a different miracle. Just sip it closed just so he couldn't talk. Um, but Jesus, like, he extends grace and he has a dialogue. That's what we as Christians should do as well. Dialogue it through. Do not be dogmatic, but he calls him a hypocrite. He was not happy. He said, you hypocrite. He says, don't you take your animals from the stall and walk with them and give them water on the Sabbath. That's okay. That's acceptable. Even if it's breaking the Sabbath, you do that because the animal needs water. Common sense. Simple common sense. This person, a person, not an animal, a daughter of Abraham, of much greater worth than any animal, has been suffering for 18 years, shouldn't be healed? Where's the logic? That's the thing. We sometimes just follow the rules, whatever they are. We sometimes need to stop and have a moment of critical thinking. 
just a moment, and he put them to shame, the religious, political entity at the time. He put them to shame because that was wrong. Jesus broke the rules because it was more important to heal people. It was more important to bless people, to be with people. He touched corpses. He wasn't allowed by the law to touch corpses. He did that. He broke the law. He touched lepers. He was not supposed to touch lepers. It was against the law. Jesus is like, I'm above the law. The greater, I'm greater than the law. I'm greater than the temple. I'm greater than all these. I'm trying to show you something new, something different. Because the lepers matter. The people on the outside matter. He dined with sinners. Because they need the doctor. The, heal, the healthy people don't need a doctor. Yeah. And we have been given a rule book in the New Testament, an example to follow. So I think we as Christians can safely say that we're unable to stop speaking about the things that we have seen and heard. That's why I think the church needs, I need a Job moment when we stop hearing and we see, see God, for now my eyes have seen you. That's why we need this radical transformation and what we call radical today, I think it's just normal Christianity. So continue from verse 23. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord, against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on their threats. Now, Lord, look on their threats. And grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. By stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. Shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Okay? Okay. I won't read further into chapter 3 today, but let's frame this for our time. What would we do if we were arrested today? Taken before a judge and told that if we keep meeting like this and causing chaos, we're shaking the community, the status quo, in the name of Jesus, we would face serious consequences. If something inside you goes, Oh, I, I wouldn't like that. Me neither. <laughs> I don't like getting arrested and being in front of a judge. Um, but ask yourself why. Like if you're standing up for something, thank you, Melinda, like all these songs about standing. I was like, it's amazing. God is at work. He's, he's the great chess master. He's moving pieces around. It's like, oh, that worship song and that thing and blah, blah, blah. And it's Reformation Day. It's like cherry on top. Thank you. So this message, I think, applies really well for us as the church today. What would we do? We don't have to like it. I don't think Peter and John liked, liked it. They were not. But what did they do? They went and prayed. They asked for more boldness. Would I go home and would I pray? Would I gather some of you with me and pray? I don't know. I have never been in that place. I don't know. But I want to be prepared. The New Testament is full of exactly those examples for us to follow for a reason. 
would our response be to pray for more boldness or for the troubles to go away? Will we pray at all? And I believe these texts are didactic. They are meant to instruct us as followers of Christ how to follow Christ. And how we should respond to similar situations. We don't cave. We pray. We pray for more convictions. To be stronger. How many of you have prayed for strength and God sends you things that make you stronger? Those things are often hard and brutal and painful. <laughs> yes. But Jesus said, my father is the vine dresser. So he takes the vine and he's like cutting this off, moving that. And all the time we're like, ah, oh, no, don't take that. No, that's my precious. No, no, I want to hold on to that. But actually being a follower of Christ is costly. That's why I recommend the book Cost of Discipleship. Because for everyone in here, following Christ has cost you something. It has cost you something. Everything. It should cost us everything. Because we give him everything because he already owns everything. He's Lord over the kings of the earth. And the thing is, you have given up addiction. You have given up uh, friends. You have given up things. You've sacrificed time, energy, effort, and all these things because they cost you something. Because you earn something so much greater on the other side in the end. And I honestly believe that your life will be more fruitful and blessed this side of heaven as well. So it's not just for the future. Would we pray at all? These texts are instructing us how to follow Christ. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We are supposed to be wise, not bombastic, not with bad character. We're actually supposed to expand the kingdom of God, not shrink it because our character sucks. No, we're supposed to be winsome, win people over, that they see in us, like they saw with John and Peter, that they spend time with Christ in every situation, even if it's flammable, that you represent Christ. You're an agent of Christ in that setting. There's a big difference between being bombastic and pushing people away and then winning people for Christ. It's a big difference. That's the wise part. So we can receive threats from family, friends, authorities, if you don't conform to whatever we want you to conform to, you will face certain consequences, just like the apostles did. What do we do then? Am I going to relocate myself off the rock to the sand just to appease people instead of pleasing the king of kings? We pray for Christ-like boldness, that others might see that we've spent time with Jesus. Just like the council knew. And when we pray like that, alone or together, in the midst of trials, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of uncertainty, my God, our God, our Savior, when we pray expecting, He's going to meet those needs. He will. But remember, it might not look just the way that we had hoped for. I prayed for years for wisdom. Honesty. That was my prayer. And I feel like God just kept sending me troubles and things to fix and figure out. And I see it now. Hindsight is always 2020. But during that time, I complained a lot. <laughs> but... When we pray expecting, and when we pray when we need it the most, he knows. He will empower us with his Holy Spirit, and I think and I believe he will shake our assembly, just like he shook theirs. 
And I think then we will start speaking the word of God with boldness. Remember, innocent as doves, wise as serpents, we as Christians have focused a lot on loving our neighbor and being innocent. I think Canadian Christians, awesome at the innocent part. Awesome. Really good. But I think we need to start focusing more on also the wise part. It's not either or. It's a false dilemma. We don't have to pick. We should have both. And I truly believe that we, me included, have been missing the wisdom part. And we need both in order to succeed in this mission that we have before us. To stand up for the kingdom of God and to do it well and in a way that glorifies God. Remember, how we stand up for God matters. It's not just enough to stand up and scream at people. (laughs) No, it's not going to work. How we stand up matters. We need to grow his kingdom. And not everyone is going to like it, be it family, friends, authorities, or whoever, but our allegiance lies with God. Honestly, he is the rock that we are saved on. There is no other name. So we ask ourselves, what does God want? Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. Worship team, you can come up. I just want to end with this. Um, during the week, this came to me just like, like that. And it was really hard for me to process in the sense that it just shook me because it was so not on my mind at the moment. But it's when there's an injustice, whether it's against you or someone you know or someone you love or something, someone that you believe in, we as Christians stand up because injustice is not biblical. It's not Christ-like. We don't sit down because then we're sitting down on the people that are suffering injustice. That's why I love the worship today because these people need you. Amen.